Welcome to Unit 2, The Media of Art. Lesson 10, Moving Images, Film, and Digital Art. Film is transformed from novel entertainment to a significant art form capable of accommodating a variety of experimental and thematic statements. Moving Images, Film, and Digital Art discusses the significance of motion pictures from black and white silent films to television, video, and digital art forms. The objectives for this lesson are to trace the development of motion pictures from its origins in photography, describe technical innovations and effects used to make motion pictures, discuss how political concerns about film's popular influence has affected motion pictures, identify and describe landmark films by directors in popular and experimental cinema, and distinguish the commercial role of television from art using video and other electronic media. The topics we'll be covering, film, the moving image, film and visual expression, early techniques, directors and artists, a parallel evolution, animation, special effects, and digital processes, television and video, video art, digital art forms, and we'll be talking about director Ridley Scott. This little experimental color film was the first of its kind in Germany. It kind of met with some trouble being shown by the oppression of the Nazi party trying to censor basically art uh, in an unusual way in the sense that the Nazis really wanted to determine for the general public what was considered art just as in some of the other theories that they had. This film will be considered experimental because it does not follow any specific narrative. It's more about the the shapes and the intertwining of images that happen when they overlap. A lot of artists that were experimenting with animation and film in these early years, some of them even painted directly onto the film cells themselves uh, to defy kind of what's been go what had been going on for about, say, 30 years, which was to film your subjects. They were taking control of the film. Before motion photography was invented in the late 1800s, mankind had always had a desire to figure out a way to make images move. One of the earliest successful examples of a device that could give someone the illusion that an image was moving was called the zoetrope. It was a drum with a sequence of images on the inside of it. If it would spin at a certain speed, you get the impression as the images would come into a certain area that they were actually moving. What we have here is a sequence of images by Edward Moybridge titled The Horse in Motion from 1878. The founder of Stanford University had a bet with Moybridge that all four legs came off the ground as a horse was running. So Moybridge took a series of cameras with trip wires had him out at a track and as the horse ran by it would trigger each camera. What they discovered after the film was developed is that Stanford was right that all four legs did come off the ground. Edward Moybridge's curiosity about motion and photography eventually led to the invention of film and film being taken seriously as artistic and visual expression. Modern film has had a standard of 24 frames per second. Each frame is a sequence of images that have been photographed with a film camera. This comes to vary when you get into different types of video cameras, but we'll mostly talk about film in this early part. But the illusion of motion in film is successful because of something called the persistence of vision, which is a brief retention of an image by the retina of our eyes after a stimulus is removed. A sequence of film shot continuously with a camera is called a shot. Now when you assemble all these shots into a film, this is called film editing. The earliest films were all silent. It takes all the way up until 1927 to come up with a system that's very standardized for all cinemas all over the world to present films with sound. One of the masters of the early silent films was Georges Millet. This is a still from Voyage to the Moon from 1902. Millet was also very responsible for coming up with innovative cinematic techniques and establishing trends that are still being used today, such as time-lapse photography, 
time lapses when you film something at a normal rate, meaning 12, 24 frames a second, but it's moving very slow so that when you present it back again, it actually looks like something is moving uh, faster than you would normally perceive. Clouds would be one thing. I'm sure most of you have seen time-lapse photography of clouds where the clouds are moving very, very quick. That's used very commonly in science fiction films and such. Maillet also uh, established the trend of fading between scenes, which is called uh, dissolves, where a scene fades to black and then comes back in. Later on in this lecture, and also as a part of this general lesson, you're going to have an interactive video assignment. And it's kind of going to start with a project I worked on with the Preservation Hall Jazz Band from New Orleans titled St. James Infirmary, King Brit Remix. I just want to do a little bit of acknowledgement ahead of time uh, where I've been really influenced by Georges Millet, in particular The Moon, from Voyage to the Moon, the still that we just looked at a few minutes ago. And uh, just to show you, uh, here's a little still in the lower right-hand corner. It's basically the poster for the St. James Infirmary Project, but this is directly taken out of a scene in the animation. Next to that is from a print of mine that goes back at least 20 years in my printmaking history. And in the upper left-hand corner, you see the original moon, a still from Georges Millet's Voyage to the Moon, a uh, scene where the rocket actually that's shot out of that giant kind of uh, thing that you just saw in the previous slide, and it goes directly into the eye of the moon. One filmmaker that's responsible pretty much for establishing all the techniques that are used in modern filmmaking today was D.W. Griffith. Um, this is a still from Intolerance, the modern story from 1916. The process of fading out between scenes, for example, was discovered accidentally when one of his photographers let the shutter close too slowly. It caused the scene to darken slowly. He used that as an artistic way of transitioning between scenes. Griffith was responsible for creating the epic film, which moved film out of the stage setting which it had for so many years and out into a large, open, wide expanse. The film Intolerance is about the acts of intolerant societies over time. This film was made in response to some criticism he received for his previous film titled Birth of the Nation. This is a film still from D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, the film previous to his 1916 film Intolerance. This film was not well received up north by uh, critics and audiences and it eventually led it to be banned for many years. As a matter of fact, many cities nowadays still won't play this film had many heavy racial overtones and stereotypes that would be definitely not accepted in society today. This slide here is a selection of frames from the Odessa step sequence, a part of the film The Battleship Patankin from 1925 by director Sergei Eisenstein. Eisenstein became very well known for his skillful use of a technique called montage, which was actually introduced in 1916 by D.W. Griffith. Montage is the selection of similar scenes that are edited together in a timely fashion to a heightened tension and to flash back and forth between different locations. 
A montage in a film allows a great many things to happen in a very short period of time, if wanted. Surrealist painter Salvador Dali and filmmaker Louis Bunnell created such films as An Andalusian Dog from 1929 that dealt with really irreverent subject matter. This is when modern filmmaking dealing with more artistic concepts really started to take hold. The Surrealists were really fascinated with the possibilities you could get by stringing together various different events that didn't seem to have much in common with each other. This is consistent with the theories of Surrealism, which dealt a lot with dreams and thoughts of the subconscious. A lot of times in our dreams, we do have the stringing together of a lot of uncommon events. This slide is a still from the film Citizen Kane by actor-director Orson Welles from 1941. Orson Welles was only 26 when he made Citizen Kane, and the film is still ranked today at the top of the best films ever made by film critics, due mostly to its creative camera angles, the use of shadows and smoke, and the way he bound scenes together to form a dramatic tension. Now, Orson Welles, although very famous for his films, really became a superstar in 1938 for a Halloween broadcast of the War of the Worlds for the Mercury Theater. Um, he creatively created panic across the United States for people who tuned in a little bit later and didn't know that it was an actual radio broadcast. This caused a lot of panic and people really to think that we were being invaded by Martians. Uh, you can still go on YouTube and actually just listen to the broadcast for free if you ever get a chance. There's a very distinct style of film that was the trend in American filmmaking during the 1940s that was probably started with Citizen Kane from Orson Welles. It's called Film Noir. Film Noir, by its name, uh, implies the darkness of something. Now, there's a very literal translation of that in the style of filmmaking to where it's usually uh, very shadow-driven in dark and moody environments. And also, it's also about the darker aspects of the American dream. The popular detective magazines and books of the 1940s certainly helped make this style of filmmaking uh, very popular in American and worldwide cinema. Director Federico Fellini's film La Dolce Vita from 1961 was a criticism of mass media's and tabloid's obsession with celebrity at the time. Even in the 1950s and 60s, photographers were known for chasing around celebrities just trying to get that best shot and to sell it to the highest bidder, always intruding on people's lives and trying to get their results. As a matter of fact, the term paparazzi was coined from this film. It was based off of one of the characters who was nicknamed Paparazzo. The name paparazzo is meant to symbolize the sound that a camera flash makes. This is a still from director Kenneth Anger's film Scorpio Rising from 1964. Scorpio Rising started the 1960s biker movie genre, um, which had a lot of success up until the late 60s, and it pretty much ended with the film Easy Rider by Dennis Hopper. Popular music had been used in films up until this point, but what was revolutionary about Scorpio Rising is that it used popular music as the soundtrack. Popular music was used more in a musical type sense, where when songs were in there, the actors or any type of character on screen would be singing it back. This is a film still from Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye from 1973. Robert Altman is no longer with us anymore, but he's a very well-known American filmmaker responsible for films, famously, mostly a M.A.S.H. and Nashville and some other popular films in the 90s, namely The Player and Shortcuts. He had a very naturalistic way of filmmaking where it was always a slice of life. His films tend to be dark, dramatic, and also covered aspects of the American life. Although most of his movies 
revolved around dramas. They always had a comedic aspect like MASH did. Now, the MASH that most of you all might be familiar with would be the TV show, which was a lot different than the movie, which was much more adult and probably had a lot more humor to it than the television show. Over the next several slides, we'll be discussing animation, special effects, and digital processes. I'm sure most of you recognize who this is. It is Mickey Mouse and a still from the sequence The Sorcerer's Apprentice from the Walt Disney film Fantasia from 1940. Walt Disney by this point was the world's leading creator of feature animated films. He was really well known after creating Bambi and Snow White in the 1930s. What's different about Fantasia is it doesn't follow like Bambi and Snow White did a long narrative or a storyline with a standard beginning, middle, and end. It was a series of different animated interpretations of classical pieces of music by composers such as Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and Igor Stravinsky. Fantasia is still considered one of Disney's best films. Today, 70 years after this film was made, Disney still dominates the film world with creating some of the top animated films. Disney, who we were just talking about as a film company, is very responsible for being influential on animation styles through many generations. They go all the way back to the 1920s, which is simply Walt Disney working as an animator, and then his film house, when he's mostly directing the films and coordinating with other artists to break new ground with film. After his death, the film company still continued pretty much in the style that Disney was working in mostly, which is this hand-drawn animation style, but eventually the uh, computer animation styles have taken over with Disney houses. They don't, as of right now, plan on making any more 2D animations. And they're also responsible for buying up other companies, uh, such as Pixar and such, to put under their wing. Pixar is also very influential in the computer animation realm. And when we look at Disney, there's no doubt that they were looking at the Pixar films. And you see now that we have Pixar and Disney Animation Studios, but they all work in the uh, computer animated style. Now, another animation style that is very popular that originated in Japan is called anime by some, Japan animation by others. No doubt, just as much as Disney, it has a tremendous influence on the youth of today and the way other animators are working. What you see in the slide is a film still from Princess Mononoke, which is an epic, fantastical tale written by uh, Hayao Miyazaki and animated by Studio Ghibli. I worked on uh, this for the New Orleans Preservation Hall Jazz Band back in 2009. I, of course, could not do this by myself. I had a group of wonderfully talented animators and compositors and digital artists that worked with me to bring my original vision to life. These all started off as little sketches and sketchbooks, as little cartoon characters, and it did take quite a long time to finally bring the um, project to uh, fruition. This was all done on the computer using uh, software for animation, namely uh, Photoshop, After Effects, and Adobe Flash. We talked a little about Guillermo del Toro's film Pan's Labyrinth in our drawing lesson when we went over the reasons why people draw. There were some samples of sketchbook pages by him. As a matter of fact, the creature that's in this was also represented in that sketchbook in the hand with the two eyeballs sketch. Del Toro also used the harmony of modern and traditional technologies together to create the really nightmarish images in this particular film. Most of the characters were digitally animated. This film is a lot different than what you would expect out of a movie with special effects like that because it had a heavy drama about Franco and the oppression from the fascists in Spain during uh, and before World War II. 
if you remember the story about Pan's Labyrinth, is about a girl going into a fantasy, basically, to escape the horrible world that she's in. But the uh, fantasy itself is actually quite horrifying. One of the people most responsible for the modern look of science fiction films, probably even more than Star Wars, is Ridley Scott. He brought some of the techniques, yes, that were used in Star Wars, but into the modern adult arena with Alien in 1979, where he created the modern horror science fiction genre. Now, he also returned to science fiction in 1982 with Blade Runner, which is still in the top best-reviewed science fiction films of all time, and also something that's somewhat a visionary. He actually took almost a 30-year absence from science fiction films, um, and the film that was most successful for him career-wise was Gladiator from several years back, where he finally got a nod for Best Picture. Ridley Scott returned to science fiction in 2012 with Prometheus, which is essentially the prequel to Alien. It still kind of had some of the standards of Alien, creating more of a suspenseful, not action-y, so to say, a science fiction film, but it was full of visuals of modern animation techniques and groundbreaking uh, new film technology that was pioneered by James Cameron in the 3D realm. So Prometheus is actually shot in 3D and also has a ton of intertwined CGI or computer-generated images uh, that's a part of its animation. If you got a chance to see this in the theater, it was quite spectacular and a worthy little notch on the wall of the uh, Alien science fiction franchise, although it kind of distanced itself a little bit by not even including the name into it. But Prometheus is the start of yet another series that's probably going to be coming out of the next several years. I don't know if Ridley Scott will be involved with everything. But uh, look forward probably to another sequel to Prometheus within the next two years. Also in addition to a still of Ridley Scott's Prometheus, there's a still from his 1989 film with Michael Douglas, Black Rain, and we also have a portrait of him at the bottom of the slide. We are now moving on from film and cinema to television and video and their artistic applications. Korean artist Nam Joon Paik has been one of the leading contributors of video as an art form over the past several decades. Artists weren't really able to experiment with video as an art form or as a medium until the mid-60s when the Sony Corporation created the Portapack, which was a portable video camera and recording device. Video had been around for a while by this point, but it was mostly limited to the studio environment for television shows and such. This image is of an installation titled Video Flag Z from 1986 by Nam Paik. The video content on the television screens have been laid out in a specific way as to resemble the American flag. There are images of Hollywood films that are flashing back and forth on the screens. This is a still of a performance with a video installation by Joan Jonas. It's titled Volcano Saga from 1987. Some artists have their video exhibited as a part of a specific performance. Usually, most of the time, you will see video in an art gallery in some type of installation or performance environment. This is a still from Matthew Barney's Cremaster 3 film, which is part of the Cremaster series from 2002. These films were originally intended to be exhibited in art galleries. They eventually have now found themselves on DVD, but... Some artists choose more of the gallery environment for their films, especially things like this that have barely any narrative at all, dealing with random subjects that are kind of hard to categorize and may not be for the most general audience or the uh, film-going public. These films follow uh, more in the conceptual 
category of filmmaking. Artist Doug Aiken is known for transforming large outdoor spaces with these big video installations. This is a slide of one such installation, which is titled Song One from 2012. He's well known for using these giant, giant projections, and usually they do surround the museum environment, meaning that installation artists a lot of time create something to transform a space or a certain area. Uh, they can also be known as sculptors and painters, uh, people that draw as well, but Aiken works, of course, in the video and film realm. This is a way, basically, to finance and keep these artists very active, and they're mostly commissioned. So these projects in general kind of a little hard to be uh, owned or held into your home unless you eventually get videos or anything accompanying talking about the particular piece. This film ran between sunset and midnight for a total of eight weeks, and that's usually how they run. The next installation will come afterwards. Most of the time, also, if you see 360-degree projection, you're usually on the inside of the space and inside of some type of dome. So it's quite a task to actually get this on the outside because you're going to have to have all sorts of varying locations of where the projectors need to be and their sizes, of course, need to be matched. Digital art comes in many forms, but the one thing that's consistent about it, it's done with the aid of a computer. Early forms of digital art were done on a plotter printer, which design is controlled by a computer. This work right here is an example of that, and it's by Vera Molnar. It's Parkour's Maquette for an Architectural Environment from 1976. This is a video cyborg created by artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson. It's titled Dina from 2004. Dina was exhibited in art galleries as a video installation. This is an interactive work where the viewer is invited to walk up to the work and speak to it via a microphone, as you see there in the image. The viewer is invited to ask questions of Dina, who is running for the fictional office of telepresident. In order to answer the viewer, Dina does a automatic search on the internet for her answers, so whatever comes out will vary from person to person according to what question they ask. Some modern artists working in the digital realm are using motion sensors as a way to have some interactivity with the viewer and a specific piece or installation, as we see here in the slide of an installation view of the Idiogenetic Machine from 2011. What happens with this particular piece is a viewer will walk into the room, the motion sensor encourages this interaction essentially with the viewer in the space and it accesses a database of illustrations that the artist has made to assemble a comic book in real time. You can download actually a PDF which is an Adobe readable document that you can either print out or just keep a digital file of of the comic at the end of the day. Some digital artists are now working in the realm of handheld devices, art being made for the iPhone, the smartphone, and modern day tablets. This is just the still of Tal Halpern's Endgame, A Cold War Love Story, which is actually an application that you interact with. So it kind of acts as a puzzle as you assemble it. Clues, videos, information pops up. Uh, that's all related to the Cold War. It's a very interesting way of having someone interact with the work, and each person's going to interact with it slightly differently. So essentially the narrative might change a little bit or become a little bit personalized. So we are now at an end of Lesson 10. Thank you for listening.